Good afternoon, friends and colleagues. Uh, please kindly take your seat. I suggest we start now. I'd like to introduce you um, the lead laboratory for this summary and synthesis session. Abigail, Raleigh from World Bank, Abigail from Barbados. Raleigh from World Bank and David from WHO Geneva and Viro from IGP Thailand, MOH. We will have an exciting session. Um, <clears throat> Before we start the session, you might like to scan the QR code so that you have the PowerPoint uh, in your hand so that you may identify uh, which slide that is not clear and you'd like to discuss, please feel free to scan the QR code. The synthesis today uh, for the conference uh, between um, 24 to 29 today. We have uh, 46 site meetings as a pre-conference and three field visits. One to Jula, one to Ramathibadi, Chakri, Nalubadin, and one for Nan. At the main conference between 27 and 29, we have two keynote address for plenary session 12, uh, 18 parallel sessions. Seven special event, launch book, etc., and eleven poster presentation. And we have also two hundred and thirty-six submission of the art con contest. In total, we have seven hundred and thirty-two participants from fifty-seven countries, more or less equal proportion between female and male, forty-six uh, versus fifty-four percent. And we have. Um, Proudly to say that we have 16% of uh, people, young people, lower than 30 years old. Altogether, we have 81 speakers and moderators, our panelists. 46.9% of 47% were female. And also, we have young people as speaker, or panelists, or moderator. Thirty-five percent come from academic background, and twenty-eight percent from CSO NGO background, and quite a few from uh, other disciplines. If we classify on the country of origin, we use the virtual six region. Um, a little bit uh, higher proportion, thirty percent from Paho or Emro, and twenty-three percent from European region. region. Today we have four outlines to report to you. For those who cannot attend um, the concurrent parallel session because we have three at one time. On the section A is on beyond parametry limits that points the human race to extinction. David will present this, followed by root causes of climate in action, presented by uh, Abigail and then potential solution by Lolly, and finally on the way forward. On the way forward, we will have um, a menti.com to engage you all in finding the way forwards. David, you have the floor. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Viraj. And just while I have the mic, um, I'll just take the opportunity to thank uh, PMAC, including the absolutely amazing team of young rapporteurs who've been sitting in the back of the sessions doing all of the real work for this. I've never been a rapporteur that's had to do so little in order to uh, produce a report. They've been absolutely uh, phenomenal. And so my job, I'll, I'll just take a few minutes, is to tackle the first of these questions. Um, so the job of, of WHO here is to tell you how terrible everything is 
before we then pass to others to say how we got here and what we're going to do about it. And I think, again, in credit to, uh, to PMAC, um, it's been it's shown, I think, a lot of courage to take on an, an issue where we're not just talking about an individual health issue or a, or a particular part of the health system problem, but, but, but actually to take on the issue of the fact uh, that it looks like we're breaching our planetary uh, boundaries and what is at risk if we don't address this issue is at least the possibility, at least a significant possibility, of human extinction. There is no bigger question uh, to deal with. And what you'll see in the slides as we go through them is some of the, the headlines that this brilliant rapporteur team has extracted from the presentations. Um, and you'll see that there are pieces that have been pick, picked out from uh, individual sessions. Of course, it's been impossible to cover everything. So what uh, we're trying to do uh, is just to tell a story um, by extracting uh, some of the pieces of wisdom from each of the sessions. But this first um, slide, you will remember, um, Johan Rockström put on the table the idea of planetary boundaries. The fact that across the various domains um, which are essential to maintaining life on Earth, including our own lives, we are starting to breach those and in some cases uh, severely breaching those. So we talked about biodiversity loss. We've talked about the drivers of biodiversity loss and climate change, including land conversion. Uh, we've touched on um, issues that we don't talk about too much, but, but we need to, such as ocean acidification, uh, affecting the health of the oceans on which um, many people depend directly and all of us depend indirectly. We've talked about the massive health burden that we already suffer from air pollution. Seven million deaths a year, one of the biggest killers that we have on the planet. And then we've also talked about the way that this has manifested itself through climate change as the overarching uh, challenge uh, that we have, the fundamental challenge to uh, life systems on Earth. We've also uh, made the connections between what is happening on the planet to our own health. And, and again, to pay uh, credit to PMAC, um, they have taken on, or we have taken on, a discussion that goes from what's happening in the, the atmosphere through exposure pathways, extreme weather events, and, and so on, down to the range of health risks that we're more used to dealing with individually um, in, in public health, or certainly in curative services, and also um, explicitly talked about things like the vulnerability factors, the things which are driving our vulnerability to these risks. Socioeconomic factors, socio-political conditions has come through very, very strongly uh, in this conference. So they've taken on, or we have taken on, a real systems approach. We have also uh, not limited it just to climate change. So um, we have added the biodiversity uh, crisis to this as well. And there's a great deal of overlap uh, between the two. They affect many of the, of the same systems, but the, the threat that we have from the loss of biodiversity threatens all of the natural systems which provide our, our goods and services and underpin our human welfare and, and the economy. And that has been taken on as well. And again, uh, to pay tribute to, to PMAC, if you look along those list of health outcomes, what has dominated um, health over the past three years is the discussion and the attempt to deal with just one of those zoonoses. Um, and yet we have taken this on as a systems-based uh, approach, looking at all of the things which have driven that emergence. Within the conference, the, <coughs> the link has been made uh, to this, um, the, the great symptom, I would say, that we've seen uh, within the last few years, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. But again, we're not just dealing with it as the COVID pandemic. This conference has discussed the drivers of that. The land use change, the wildlife uh, change, intensified livestock production, climate change, which are driving possibly the emergence of COVID-19, but definitely the emergence of most of the pandemics that we, uh, that we face at the moment. Um, it is also... Uh, dealt not just with individual diseases, it's looked at how we're doing across the board uh, in terms of environmental challenges to health. And as we have, uh, as has been very clear through the discussions, we are not doing well. Um, environmental risk factors are responsible for about a quarter of the global burden of disease. And again, we have good evidence of the, uh, the impacts of some of the drivers of the climate crisis, the um, inefficient energy systems, the polluting energy systems, 
uh, which we're, we're currently using, which are driving um, these massive burdens of air pollution at the same time as uh, they're driving the climate crisis. And we've heard the same stories about those drivers of uh, unsustainable food systems, unsustainable land use systems, driving our obesity crisis at the same time as they're driving the, um, uh, the climate crisis. And we haven't just restricted ourselves to dealing with simple relationships either. There's been a great deal of discussion about the relationship between climate and the environment and land use uh, and biodiversity and our food systems. And the, the estimate is, the evidence is, that one of the greatest threats that we have from climate change and environmental destruction is the undermining of our food systems, both in terms of food security, but also the quality of the food that, uh, food that we eat. Um, but as I come to the end of my part of uh, the presentation, we have seen some of the signals of the evidence that we can tackle this problem. So if we look, for example, at the issue of food and nutrition uh, security, um, there are opportunities available, for example, in the production system through improved efficiency, uh, through um, increased yields, through the consumption system, through loss and waste, and through a food system, an overall food systems approach, that if we were to implement uh, the things that we know need to be done and that we have the evidence for, we could actually fulfill the target of the Paris Agreement and, by the way, get a massive amount of, of better health. So in diagnosing the problem, we also start to see uh, some of the solutions as well. I think this, is, this may be the final slide that I have. And it's one of the things I've learned from this conference is never give a presentation just based on the evidence. Tell a story as well. The story I would like to tell here is when I'm dealing with my colleagues um, in, the, in the, the, the team uh, back in Geneva, and particularly my colleague uh, Marina, who's been involved with organizing this and uh, can't be here, whenever we get asked to write something, I'll say, oh, I'll go away and write that. She says, no, stop, stop, stop. Don't. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Somebody has probably already written that and written it better. And so I think this is a really good example of this. This is the declaration uh, from, uh, from the Rio Plus 20 uh, agreement. So this is from the sustainable, uh, uh, effectively from the, the, the declaration for the, for the SDGs. And if you see the language on this slide, it basically incorporates everything that we've discussed in this conference. Um, it makes that link between health being a precondition for and an outcome of all of the aspects of sustainable development. It doesn't talk about individual diseases. It talks about action on the social and environmental determinants of health. It talks about how we need to protect vulnerable populations and so on. So we know what we need uh, to do. In fact, we've already agreed to do it. Uh, the next part of the discussion is to say, why haven't we done it so far? And therefore, what are we going to do about it? That I hand over to Abigail. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dermot would have mentioned just now, I have the very short task of telling you why we are not seeing any progress. So I'm going to speak about a, a bit about the root causes of climate inaction. So we're starting with some of the challenges that we face, and we, we recognize that this is it's a very complex issue, and it's, it's influenced by economic, political, and social factors. And for any of you that would have probably attended the conference of parties in, um, in Egypt last year, you, you're recognizing that we're seeing a lack of political will. Um, many persons and many governments who they are hesitant to commit to emission reductions that can and, and will negatively impact their economies. You saw that about the US, which is a major contributor to global emissions. They, they left the Paris Agreement and WHO. Uh, they, they did subsequently return as well, though. Additionally, we did have the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, as many you, of you may know, because a lot of you are in the health sector, it, did, it had a, and resulted in very bad well, economic downturns and fiscal constraints uh, to commit large resources because many countries were focused on economic recovery. And additionally, again, we do, we do see uh, the lack of political will and accountability to citizens, uh, politicians and decision ma makers, they focus on short-term gains. We've not yet reached a point in our life, well, or in our countries, in the world, really, 
where we ha have allowed um, how the health of um, not just the residents of the earth, but the, the animals and, and the plants to supersede that of making a profit. Unfortunately, we've not gotten there as yet. And additionally, we, we've seen uh, increased lobbying by fossil fuel interests, which has posed a major barrier for, for us to get in any progress, really. Uh, so additionally, we continue with inadequate global cooperation. Uh, lower and middle income countries, they are victims uh, are victims of exploitation by high income countries. They, they, have, they generally have inadequate implementation capacity, uh, financial, technical, and institutional um, difficulties as well. They lack resources for my, uh, mitigation and adaptation. And uh, they have more pressing uh, development pr priorities such as uh, poverty reduction and economic growth. Additionally, there is a climate delay discourse and it seeks to highlight the negative social effects of climate actions and cast uh, a doubt on mitigation feasibility. And uh, the, the, the thing about this really is that they, they recognize that climate change is a problem, but they, they seek not to put forth solutions really uh, and they do this by an, in a number of ways, and they, they try to redirect responsibility. There is a push for non-transformative uh, solutions. Uh, they emphasize the downsides, uh, appeal to your well-being, appeal to social justice, and then, and then when after all, well, when all of that has failed, they, they surrender. They they promote the message of doomism, and that change is impossible. Uh, so what some other things that are promoting, uh, well, climate in action would be misinformation and denial. There has been an emergence of climate contrarians and the denial of uh, scientific consensus. Uh, if you look at the uh, image on the right, uh, it's a bit, well, it's a, low, it's a graph and it, it shows, you see two things. Uh, so the green is actually uh, articles that are mentioning climate change and the orange is, uh, well, articles that are mentioning climate change as well, but, uh, they, um, but more so in return, in relation more so to climate skepticism. And you can see that there has been an increase in uh, articles which do mention climate change, but there's also been an increase in climate skepticism as well. So that, that's where you're getting this misinformation and denial, and that's coupled with the fact that there is a denial of the scientific consensus. Uh, additionally, we, we have dilemmas on solutions. Um, we, 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 uh, we argue about uh, mitigation, uh, the cost effectiveness of it, the feasibility of transitioning to renewable energy, the, the lack of scientific certainty, and the negative impact on the economy. Uh, uh, so this is really uh, just a synopsis of uh, what was discussed at the conference about the things that are um, well leading to climate inaction, and it would be remiss of us to propose problems and not uh, give any solutions. So I'll hand over to Loretta, and she's going to tell you a bit about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I am happy that um, I am here to talk about the solutions. I think um, Abby and Yarmid has um, outlined really well what are those different challenges and um, we are facing in terms of how do we address health, but at the same time, we know that climate change is going to impact um, health outcomes. And so we need to do something to try to integrate the solutions on um, health and climate change um, nexus. And um, as um, Diarmid has mentioned, we would like to thank the um, energetic and uh, very hardworking um, youth uh, group who actually developed and put together all this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So basically what I will um, outline here are the consensus uh, during the various discussions uh, during the plenary and the side events um, during the during the PMAC session. So one of the um, important solution that was identified um, during this uh, conference is that we need to put sufficient financial resources to be able to invest um, in health and climate change and uh, tackle those uh, relevant issues. And when we talk about financing, that means uh, we need to um, innovate um, green health financing solutions 
um, and we uh, listened to an example that it can be done. Uh, this is being done now in Egypt, and uh, they have shared with us some of their uh, challenges, but at the same time, successes in implementing the program. And other programs that were highlighted include um, innovative financing options like the pandemic fund, um, and also the funding from the climate investment funds um, where I work with, and then the uh, clean cooking fund and opportunities for applying blended financing in order to address uh, different issues on health that impacts, um, different issues on climate change that impacts on health. And one of the things also that uh, was discussed and um, as and identified as a possible solution is how we can integrate health agenda into climate change funding. And um, one of the sources of funding that was identified, uh, for example, is the Green Climate Fund. And at the same time, there's also an opportunity to combine climate change agenda with existing funding for health programs. There was also a very um, lively discussion on how the engagement of the private sector plays an important role in addressing uh, the climate change and health uh, interconnection. The next potential solution that was identified is uh, how do we promote a sustainable food system? And promoting sustainable food system should begin from production until consumption. And how do we do this? These are uh, some of the things that we identified um, that we can do. So basically, the need to adopt the principle of uh, food sovereignty, where the people who produce, distribute, and consume the food also controls the mechanisms and policies for production and distribution. Other things, um, I mean, other steps identified is also the transformation from monocultural farming to biodiversification, promote, promoting sustainable and healthy food systems, promoting sustainable farming, which includes um, regenerating soil, reducing chemicals, promoting biogas production in livestock farms, and also the use of climate resilient crops to address some drought uh, related issues or some flooding issues. There was also mention about the importance of nature-based diet where we consume food that are organic and um, that doesn't use a lot of chemicals. This is another um, important concept and idea that uh, emerged from the discussion. The importance of um, nature-based solutions where um, there was a strong recognition that nature and people um, can work in harmony and by doing that, there is an opportunity to improve health outcomes and also improve the overall well-being of uh, communities. And um, in the discussion, there was also an emphasis on the important role of indigenous people and local communities in the use of nature-based solutions uh, to impact on health and also to address various climate change issues. Examples include the Gorilla Coffee Alliance and, of course, um, the very famous um, non-sandbox project that advocated for a reforestation program that would involve the communities and will allow the communities to identify unique solutions to address the deforestation, but at the same time contribute to improving um, improving health um, in, in local communities. And then next um, is the discussion on how we can promote One Health. And One Health is basically the intersection of how we will be able to adopt a very good strategy in promoting good health, not only for human beings, but also for the environment, the plant, and the animals. And when we talk about One Health, we wanted to extend it to a broad vision of including environment and biodiversity protection. To promote One Health, um, it is also important to, um, to encourage collaboration and coordination by identifying platforms to engage not only the health professionals but other relevant experts to come to the table and provide their insights and suggestions on how 
um, working together, we can identify working solutions. And then the next one is uh, the importance of uh, clear communication. We need to identify strategic uh, opportunities uh, like conferences, like uh, an example, a very good example is PIMA, to promote investments in health, climate change, and biodiversity interconnection. And of course, capacity building is also very important. We need to improve the understanding of the linkages between health, climate change, and um, biodiversity. The role of the health sector um, cannot be um, overemphasized during this uh, particular conference. And um, we realize that there is really a very significant role to play from the health sector and the health professionals in order to identify solutions that would work to address climate change, to address biodiversity, but at the same time promote better health outcomes. So one is uh, we need to invest in health workforce uh, development by capacity building, um, in you know implementing um, in implementing or including climate change in the curriculum of healthcare professionals, um, transforming the education by building the mindsets of health professionals on how health, climate change, and biodiversity are all interconnected. And at the same time, there is an opportunity uh, to promote um, uh, climate smart um, public health care systems and also um, climate smart health care facilities. And this can be done by placing climate policy as a priority in facilities and management uh, and supply chain. And also recognizing that there is an opportunity to address climate change and how the health systems contribute to climate change by the use of um, uh, re uh, renewable energy and better wastewater management. It also includes um, trying to adapt by digestion for disposal of organic and pathological healthcare uh, waste. And then um, one example is the Boston uh, Medical Center Center rooftop farm that can be used in hospitals, which was uh, presented in one of the plenary session. And of course, um, there is a need to advocate for cross-sectoral engagement, particularly in um, discussions on climate change issue by using health as an argument. There's also um, a very important point about the full engagement of the healthcare sector in climate change uh, negotiations and climate change negotiations and uh, climate change process because normally um, they are not um, a significant um, representative in these negotiations and it is the right time to include the health sector and the health professional in the discussion to ensure that um, the health sector will be able to identify and will be given a priority and uh, the required funding to address some of those climate change impacts that affect um, the sector itself. This is an example uh, that uh, on, on how um, we can promote um, uh, climate smart uh, health care facilities. This is basically a uh, um, uh, an artwork by a pharmacist uh, that works in the uh, CN Medical Institute here in Thailand where he was able to illustrate how um, installing solar rooftops, improving uh, waste management, and introducing uh, climate change in the uh, health curriculum of um, uh, doctors, nurses, and other medical pr practitioners were adopted by uh, CN Medical Institute of Thailand. And um, I think I'm coming to my last slide, which is a very important um, part of possible solutions in order to address um, better health outcomes while uh, we are confronted with issues of biodiversity loss and um, climate crisis. The importance of, you know, um, what actions we need to take and how can we encourage everyone to act and contribute uh, to the cause. So basically, by putting people at the center of the responses, giving people uh, agency to act and become partners uh, in the solution, 
based on um, equitable and ethical practices. So part of this is empowering the most vulnerable, and that includes uh, giving voice and wisdom uh, to the youth, women, and indigenous people. There were uh, a lot of uh, youth um, representatives that came uh, in PMAC, and I think that's a very good indication on how much we can rely on them in terms of um, advocacy and implementing implementing various uh, strategic responses in order to promote better health outcomes in the face of climate crisis. So it is important to reorient uh, policy spaces and integra integrate young people as natural and equal partners in this very important agenda. And of course, it is also important to provide funding to grassroots and youth-led initiatives, especially those that focuses on climate change and health. And um, as I've mentioned earlier, one important um, next step that uh, we can try to consider is how we can integrate climate change into all forms of education, uh, even um, for primary school and secondary schools. We also need to simplify the message for the population so that it would be easy to understand. And um, it would be important to engage the local journalists because they can provide some recommendations and suggestions on how to better educate uh, people about climate change, the interconnection between climate change, health, and biodiversity. And I'm coming to the last point uh, with regards to um, how we can encourage everyone um, to um, contribute to the whole strategy and plan in addressing climate change and health issues. We need to inform, educate, and also empower local communities about climate change and what are the types of actions that they could uh, implement locally. Thank you very much. I hand it over to you, Sir Dr. Biroj. And this is the summary by the same artist. Um, Tanasak, where are you? Please stand up. This is um, a dentist yeah, serving the Thai Royal Army, uh, but uh, he is one of the young people and served as a rapporteur here. So this summarizes the potential solution that Lolly has uh, discuss about. Now we go to the last section on how we go forward. Then we invite uh, the secretary to post on the screen on the menti.com. You have some exercise, please scan QR code now. Or if you have notebook, you use worldwidewebmenti.com and add the password. On the lower border, lower quadrant is the head count of number of participants who involved in the survey, menti.com. Please do. If you have come across with problem in access to menti.com, please raise your hand. Secret will help you. I see none. They are with different uh, age cohort. Everyone are very well versed with mobile phone applications. We have more than 120, 40. We'll check this number with the registration if anyone sneak out. <laughs> Still coming up. 180, 90. Two hundred.
Right. Now we will see the distribution of the age range. I should join, but I cannot join. <laughs> 14 more than 60, and 36 less than 30 years old. So we have uh, about 160, 70 head count. Almost equal size. Abigail, did you join? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Lolly, let me. Okay, good. Now we move to the question. Hundred and eighty three participants, forty nine, fifty from the first group. Then this, this is a good sign. We have more young people stay until the end. And we will com compare with the first um, uh, age distribution and number. They stay until the end. Please use <coughs> verb. Action start with verb, not a sentence, three, four words. That start with verb. What is the top three priorities that you will do after this conference to protect health from climate impact? and biodiversity lost. So this word cow will give you a sense how do we go. Uh, you can zoom and take a picture, but we will save this and put into the conference proceeding and report. You may like to look at the actions to be taken forward by you, whether it's classified under mitigation or adaptation, or supporting evidence to mitigate and adapt. So the biggest word is advocate. Recycle, research, collaborate, advocacies, reduce, collaborate. So that means multi-sectoral collaboration, communication. To act. Take actions, communicate, empower, activism, still 
the top runner is advocacy, recycle, collaboration. Now we go to Q&A. Whether what you are doing is consistent with what the secret, with the red laboratory present you on the potential solution by l a w l e if they synchronize with what you want to do, the floor is open. We have some um, 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes for Q&A from the floor. I see none. <clears throat> Question or discussion from the floor on this very important conference during the last three days of discussion. Honey, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Viroj. h a n y s r a k from University of Texas Medical Branch and People's Health Movement. Um, I think one of the issues that were discussed is uh, at the governance and the importance of be selective when you choose those who should be in the in the table for decision making. I think this was not very uh, elaborated in the in the synthesis. So um, we need to challenge the broken governance at national and global level to be able to advance. With climate uh, um, activism for health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hani. Uh, further suggestion and comments so that we can complete our proceeding within two months. David Nabalo. Hello. Thank you, uh, v e r o j and thank you to everybody, the rapporteurs and the team that's done the work. One of the things that's really impressed me in this conference is the need for not just for collaboration across sectors, but also quite new ways of thinking and working. We and many of us have been brought up in universities which have encouraged deeper and deeper s p e c i a l i z a t i o n in narrower and narrower technical fields. And we get stuck in our technical fields, and it, it's our comfort zone, the field that we own, perhaps, or feel we own. But this this conference has, for me, been about different ways of thinking and working. I'm very impressed by the concept of systems thinking, and the work of Peter Senge, which was referred to during the conference. And uh, I didn't feel it. Necessarily there. Perhaps it doesn't need to be there. Perhaps people half my age have, have moved away from linear thought and linear action and unidisciplinary working and focusing on narrow specialisms. But I personally believe that what I've learnt here is that we can perform our work better as people's health professionals, perhaps by. Shifting to a, a living systems approach, as Vandana Shiva invited us to do at the beginning, and I'd like to, if, if others agree, I'd like to see that reflected in the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. Any further comment or suggestion to complete the report and the summary? If not, I. Like to acknowledge the contribution by. Oh, sorry, you have to f r o s t e r Hi, v i r o j r a u l b a r m e h o from UNICEF. I was just wondering if we could consider in future conferences a more climate-sensitive conference. For example, this room doesn't have to be this cold. <laughs> it, should, it should start from ourselves. We're talking about big solutions, and there are low-hanging fruits that we can do ourselves. And then the second point I wanted to make was also a disability inclusive conference. Persons with disabilities are probably one of those groups disproportion, disproportionately affected by the climate and diversity crisis that we are talking about here. But I 
I don't feel their presence nor their voice heard here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, point well taken and action will be taken next year uh, so that we make sure that the temp will no more than 25 degrees Celsius. I promise. Dr. Chilitai Subit, you promise, right? 25 degrees Celsius. Also on the disability inclusive. Um, we have ratified, most of the country ratified the UNCRPD Convention of People Living with Disabilities. And the progress has not been that so exciting. According to numerous publications by government report as well as the parallel non-state actor report to the UN Commission Commissioner in Geneva, for, for which they listen to the report every now and then. So that we include people with living with disability to in, uh, include in the conference and the discourse and on the table. You have the floor. Thank you. Julia Lofreda from Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh, and People's yeah, Health yeah. Movement. Uh, just a reflection, and for us all to think about how we uh, see and consider health system resilience, and just a suggestion to see resilience not to be blind to the way power shapes all the health systems and how, why, and for whom shock responsive capabilities and to emergencies and uh, climate emergencies are developed and supported. So just an encouragement to see resilience not seen as an out outcome, but actually see as uh, it's how the system performs, it's, it's important, and how we get to this outcome. Thank you. Thank you. You have to follow, sir. Madam, on the left hand side. The mind doesn't work. Can you step forward? Dipari from the Rockefeller Foundation. Of course, I want to begin by congratulating you, Dr. Viroj, for a phenomenal PMAC uh, convening. And I want to endorse everything that has been said in terms of the potential actions. Uh, as Dr. Naveen, who's sitting here, you know, our senior executive vice president has been saying, you know, this is a group of people where we're very aligned in terms of our thinking. You know, we are very much in sync with everything that's emerged from here. But there are many actors outside this room who are going to play a very, very important role if you want to really move forward on all that we want to do. So I think one of the opportunities for us is to really see how we are going to be advocating, which came out as a major theme of the actions that we wanted to take. With whom are we going to advocate? And I think there's very significant players in this room who can play a very important role in terms of guiding us around who those significant actors that we want to bring into this conversation to really act in a nimble and quicker way because we are in a crisis mode right now. I think we also have wonderful opportunities in the region that are coming up, whether it's G20 in the, under, the India's, under India's presidency, where how can we take some of the recommendations that have come out over here and really get our G20 leaders to be endorsing it because Action really needs to start from there. Financing and all those things will flow. Likewise, we have G7 happening in Japan. And most importantly, at COP28, we have health as a major area that is going to be discussed. So I think we'd really want to see how we can really drive from PMAC around all the wonderful actions that have been emerged to really lead to some significant change. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dipali. Um, we have uh, JICA as um, one of the members of the IOC, International Organizing Committee, and that JICA take, can take this forward to G7 to be hosted by Japan government. On G20, we have a personal conversation with a colleague in Delhi, so that um, this conversation will be further discussed further in uh, G20. You have to foster. Yes, thank you. My name is Mohammed. I'm uh, from the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. 
maybe just a recommendation, I would say, because it's something I have been speaking about with someone yesterday. I'm not sure he wants me to mention his name, but I know he will recognize what I mean. But uh, I would say also in terms of the inclusivity, I can see here in the room and I can see in the conference so many well-educated people, so many people who got the opportunities to uh, lead organizations, to be part of big movements, to be part of so many uh, areas where they can speak out. But there are so many people out there, I would say even on the personal level in my country, who did not have the platform to speak up, who are suffering more from the impacts of the climate change, who are suffering more from global health issues, and they do not have the opportunity to speak. They do not have such conferences to speak in. They cannot go to COP and they cannot go anywhere. So I believe next times, or like for future PMAX as well, it would be great to, instead of getting the, like I would say, the very well-educated, well-recognized, well-informed uh, people about global health issues, which is quite important, I would say, the expertise, it's very much important to balance and get also the people who might not be educated, who might not have a job, who might not be able to afford a daily living just because of the impacts that this world has had on their health and get them to speak because this would be their only opportunity to speak up for what they actually live and experience. It would be great to give them the space to speak upon themselves or on behalf of themselves instead of us speaking on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I think you will be the last speaker. You have to conclude. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanne Castro from Path Foundation Philippines. And um, we, talk, we have been talking about um, Mother Earth for the past few days. But I think what we're missing are the concerns of the mothers and the women. And um, in the call, we talk about inclusivity and we talk about youth and indigenous peoples. But I work with uh, women's groups and one of the things that they raise is that they know about climate change, um, but they don't know how to describe it. They are experiencing it. And one of the things that they wanted us to know is that they need their sexual and reproductive health rights to be addressed and uh, the, the effects of climate change to their children that they have to move to the city to work because of declining resources that's affecting the lives and the income and uh, um, families in, in vulnerable communities. So I hope that the next PMAP will talk about integrated approaches that would be inclusive of the population, demographics, and the sexual and reproductive health issues of women. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the young people, 68 of them, both international and Thai, who serve as a session laboratory. Please stand up and give a big applause to them. They are all young people, less than 30 years old, quite a good number of medical students and public health students. Um, we have a daily briefing, and yesterday we stay over until 8, and they have a good reflection on what they have learned. Um, and thank you so much, because this synthesis is not possible without them. And we have um, Ankana here, and Titipon, please stand up. <laughs> Walisa and Walaipon is traveling to EB Geneva. They have left. And thank you so much, everyone. I return the floor back to the secretary. Thank you so much, and have a safe travel.